Welcome to Accountable, where your business is our business. Hosted by David R. Peters. Today's guest is Patsy Daniels. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Accountable, the podcast for CFOs by a CFO. My name is David Peters. Thank you for being here for this episode. Did you know that the world is full of data? Yeah, the world is full of data. I know. Mind blowing, right? It seems like we hear something about data basically every day, you know, somewhere in the business news, maybe uh, somewhere uh, on the radio or on TV. We hear about companies doing something with data all the time. And if you're like me, you, you say to yourself, why can't I get my company to harness the power of data. How do I do that? What does it look like? And what do I need to do to really take advantage of the data that my company has? And the thing is, is that a lot of us with that have backgrounds in finance, we typically don't have a background on the technical side of data. We don't have a a background in data warehousing or, uh, you know, information uh, sciences or anything like that. And so this seems like an unfamiliar world to us. And yet companies are are asking us to be involved in the data function because they really look at that as being a way forward for companies. They look at that as being something very powerful that uh, a company can can do right now to help increase revenue or sometimes uh, streamline expenses. Today, we're going to be talking about data warehousing, and we're going to be talking about the technical side of data warehousing, but don't worry, it's okay, it's going to be okay, because we're not going to be talking about coding, okay? This is not a conversation about coding. Like I said, this is a podcast for CFOs. We're going to be talking about the things that you need to be thinking about as you are trying to build out the data function in your company. And my guest today is Patsy Daniels. Patsy Daniels has about 10 years of experience in data warehousing. She is a senior data warehouse developer at Atlantic Union Bank in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And one of the things that I love about Patsy, Patsy was a a, a colleague of mine when I was at Compare.com, and she does a great job of sort of making these very technical concepts, these very IT-heavy conversations about data warehousing and turning it into something that we can digest and really make decisions from. So uh, I think that she's a great guest to have on a show like this where we're really just trying to look and try to figure out how exactly do we harness the power of data for our companies, and uh, her and I are going to have a great conversation about that. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I hope you are too. Enjoy my conversation with Patsy Daniels. All right. Well, uh, Patsy, uh, welcome to Accountable. Hi, glad to be here. Good to see you, Dave. Yeah, good to see you too, Patsy. Uh, so uh, Patsy Daniels is a uh, senior data warehouse developer at Atlantic Union Bank. And uh, I think we got a great topic here today because this is a really timely topic, I think, for a lot of the folks that are listening out there. Uh, data is one of those things that I think is in a lot of the financial leaders of the company. It's in their face. I mean, we get bombarded every single day it seems like there's something out in the New York Times or Forbes or some of the, and name any business publication, and companies are talking about how exactly they're utilizing data. I think most of the folks out there, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking to themselves, okay, so I see the fact that there's data around me, but I don't know how to kind of harness it. Um, and so I guess, I guess maybe the place to start is, is it seems like every company these days is looking to gain a competitive advantage with data. What holds them back from doing more with their data? What would you say? Uh, I would say it's a couple of things. One of the key things is finding people that can connect 
the t your technical resources with the business. If you okay. um, start a data warehouse project and you ha have a team of you know talented developers that hide in a room and read some stuff about your industry and build a data warehouse and they only look at the data and they never talk to a business person, that project will probably fail. Um, <laughs> you really have to have um, that sharing of this is, you know, these are our processes, this is how this data gets generated, this is what this means when we say this. Um, there's also concepts like shared terminology, shared ideas. If you remember um, when we've worked together before, like, what is a quote in an insurance company that can right. become a very lengthy, you know, different people mean different things when they say the term customer quotes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, there's gotta be kind of this meeting of the minds then I th I think what you're saying is, is that there's gotta be kind of this meeting of the minds then between kind of the technical folks that are actually kind of doing the building and mm -hmm. the business folks that, uh, you know, that, uh, are, are kind of putting together the requ uh, the, uh, requirements and are trying to, trying to kind of figure out what the business needs. Uh, is, is that, is that more or less, uh, more or less correct? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say, um, you know, another thing that can be ominous is, as you were saying, people, companies, especially lar uh, older companies, they have so much data, it can feel overwhelming to know what to do. So um, another aspect of starting a data warehouse project is the, the idea of um, making sure that you sort of scope out the initial project and you're not trying to boil the ocean. That That's a term we use at my company a lot. Like, let's not try to boil the ocean. Let's get this right. done, right? Um, so making sure that you define a really clear scope and say, this is what it's going to do. Um, I think of a really good example, and I, I guess it's hard not to go to go back to our shared work experience, like things sure. used together. Um, when you have something, um, I think a lot of companies have, say, a management pack or something that's really involved to build, where you have talented analysts that are good in Excel, and they're doing all these Excel manipulations to make this thing. And you, you can get by on that for a good long while, right? But eventually, you're going to meet the limitations of Excel, <laughs> or something's going to change, and now it doesn't fit. Um, th those can be a really good place if you kind of, we're going to automate this and give ourselves new capabilities. That can be a really excellent place to start. Plus, it helps you. You have something to validate against. It helps the business right. trust the data warehouse. The sooner people see that benefit of the project, like, you know, what, what am I getting for my money for this investment? That faster, that agile, like faster turnaround here's a prototype, how does this look? That That's key to that the success of that type of thing. I, I think I think that's a great point. I mean, uh, you know, and and I can tell you, you know, it is, um, you know, if you, I think the one thing that I think I've learned at least about data is, is that you got to put your time in up front. Um, you know, if you can put your time in up front, uh, you know, that uh, you're where you're talking with uh, the folks that are actually doing the building that are trying to meet the definitions of the business, too. I mean, uh, you talked about uh, how something very simple, like what is an auto insurance quote, uh, that that can be a very uh, uh, difficult, uh, you know, it's a, conceptually, it's not that hard to define, but to actually build that into the data warehouse, well, that that's significantly harder. And I and uh, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes I think uh, we on the on the business side, I think we maybe underestimate that a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and there's also that, that connection between the data and business terminology. Like you might have something in your system, you know, like the business talks about, um, you know, say you're a retail company and you operate on coupons, like you're measuring the effectiveness of coupons, but everywhere in the data, it's called, you know, discount code or whatever. Right, right, right. Um, so um, I think, you know, thinking about things like metadata and just helping to make that translation between in the system, it's called this, but in the business, this is when we talk about coupons, we're talking about this code or this field, right? Like that, that's also a, a key part to that success because otherwise, you know, they may be looking at a field, a CPN field that has nothing to do with coupons and suddenly yeah. you're way off track, right? So yeah. that connection, I mean... That's absolutely key. 
Uh, now, you said an interesting term there. Um, so mm-hmm. metadata, um, that's a term that I think a lot of us have heard. Um, what what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, could you just explain what exactly the, uh, you, you mean by the term metadata? Because I think that's one that we hear a lot. Right, right. So, so metadata is, in really basic, simple terms, is data about your data. Okay. <laughs> it's met- meta, right? That's that's kind of what that implies. But in um, a lot of businesses, people talk about it like a they call it a data dictionary, or it's um, as a, that example I was giving. It's the translation between a business term and a field in a system. So it helps you understand, like, because otherwise, if you have an analyst looking for something, if they never um, know that that field is related to this term, they'll say, oh, I can't find it, or it's not in there, or you, you, you know, you miss capability. So having good metadata, that, that's key. Um, you could use the term, you know, it's a Rosetta Stone. It helps translate the business and the technical so that analysts can find things, the developers can find things, and you, you know that you're talking about the same thing. Okay. All right. So yeah. So um. So uh, thank you very much for for doing that. I want to make sure though that uh, you know, especially for our folks that you know that they're struggling, uh, you know, to do this kind of within their company and kind of bring all this together. I want to make sure that they're uh, that they're following here. Um. It, so I, let's let's talk a little bit about because uh, I think that sometimes uh, some of our finance folks they're tasked with putting together, um, not necessarily sort of getting in and uh, you know doing the coding, uh, you know, or anything like that. But trying to put the right players on the field and and trying to make sure that they have a good data team. Um, I, what would you say? I mean, who should really be on a data team? Uh, any sort of rules of thumb, things that you've seen that have worked, maybe th- some things that you've seen that have not worked? Uh, yeah, as I said, I mean, you, you kind of have to have at least a few people on that team, you know, that are that can, that are either business people who develop some technical skills or technical people who are interested and understand business. Because otherwise, I mean, I've met some very talented developers who just don't grasp business concepts and without a lot of guidance, they're not quite going to give you what you want. So people that can talk business, um, I mean, and really people who came, um, I think a lot of times former analysts or people who came from the business and become technical can be your um, the real key because they also understand priority. Like sometimes if you have a lot of things in flight and they're, you're trying to figure out which things to do, you know, that person can help say, well, how about we do this for now? We'll put these more difficult things off later because they understand the priority better. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost sounds like it's almost like uh, uh, the technical folks and, and the folks on the business side, it's almost like they have like two different languages. And it's almost like, uh, you know, so you got to have like at least like one person that so can sort of like translate from one side to the other. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, another way, um, you know, I think there it can be um, intimidating as far as the cost or having a project that just goes on and on and on. Right. Um, I mean, there, there are some interesting tools on the market. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, the more we talk about this, I feel like this is more like a several hours type of, <laughs> like, it's yeah. really hard to fit all this in. But um, I guess a couple of things I would mention too is if you have an extremely limited budget, like let's say you're trying to, you want to utilize your data, um, but you just don't feel like you can build out a team, um, there are some tools out there, and I guess I'll even name drop them because I'm not using any of them. I'm, it's you know, I'm not selling anything here. Yeah. Um, but um, even tools like within Tableau, for example, it has a lot of, um, and you could, you know, you ha- say you hire an analyst, they're working on desktop, they're doing some data manipulation, they're learning how these things fit together. Um, a lot of those things can then be you know, you upgrade the server, you can use those things you've built and build on it. Um, there's even tool, there's other tools that sort of automate, you know, the data import and cleansing that um, can get you, you, you know, you could have an analyst, you're, you're going to pay for software, maybe yeah. than the person at that point, but you're kind of building a capability that when you do build that team, you've got that subject matter expert that will drive building the right things and things that make sense for your business. So I think there's a lot of tools. Alteryx is a, another one I can think of that's a pretty powerful, like 
data integration and cleansing tool. Um, and then there's a, uh, actually our, um, there was some software I tried at one point. It's called Wearscape. Um, okay. There's even a lot of things coming out now that are kind of code that writes code. It gets very meta, right? But it's yeah, yeah. A code generation tool where you don't necessarily need to be technical. You need to you need to grasp databases, but I mean you can have people that are um, that can configure um, and the tool does a lot of that documentation and a lot of the code generation for you. Um, I know, uh, I can't think of his name, but I know um, like Admiral Group, where we used to work, one of the leaders there had a very successful implementation with Wearscape. So he has a very tiny team, but he's buying, he's buying expensive software. Right. You know, from a cost benefit analysis, I guess, of a tool like that. I mean, it does mean you're sort of married to that software. I mean, because that's where everything lives, but it does. Yep give you a ton of capability with just a couple of people who understand the business can, can get you pretty far um, investing in tools like that as well. So kind of I, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, so, you know, I mean, so it's, uh, you know, part of this is, uh, is, you know, trying to find the right software that's going to fit uh, what you're trying to do on <laughs> some level. It's, it sounds like what you're saying is, is that with kind of the right type of software that maybe we can get by with, with lesser people. Is, I mean, is that fair? Um, yeah, it's it would be fewer people, but you know they they need to be skilled, right? Sure, and, right. And, but yeah, you you can that that's definitely um, an approach you could take. Um, on the other, on the flip side of that, though, I mean, there's a lot of excellent um, capabilities with open source software, and you know, if you're, I know a lot of people are more um, conservative companies, and maybe aren't comfortable with open source, but um, Microsoft Azure has tons of integration with open source languages and, you know, you, you have controls around that. There are ways you can keep that from, from inter, uh, introducing risk. Um, and what you end up there is the software cost is very inexpensive. The, the other benefit of open source, and that, that's a bit more of the um, approach we're moving towards. Um, my current experience, like writing a lot more Python and trying to write, um, you know, you can write a lot of your code to be a little more platform agnostic. So you're not, if you decided you wanted to migrate from, say, Microsoft to um, AWS, your code base, you don't have to make a whole lot of changes necessarily to lift and shift to a different platform. So that's that's the other side of that coin. If you buy, if you invest in the software, not the people, you're kind of going to be stuck with the software. Right. Um, and invest in the people and end up building software that is more lift and shift, like a little more flexible. If you find a cheaper cheaper storage, you find a new, you want to change to a different cloud platform, you can write a code base that you that is um, mig more migratable and you're less, you know, constricted. I, I think uh, I think that's a great point. So so I hope uh, you know to to our listeners too. I mean uh, certainly that's a a concern is is uh, you know where where do I want to spend the money? I mean so if I mean if we really want to make sort of data a part of our business, um, then where do I want to spend the money? Do I want to spend the money on the software? Do I want to spend the money on the people? And kind of where's that line? Um, how how uh, how should they go uh, go about kind of evaluating? Uh, you know, kind of their needs in terms of software. I mean, so, because a lot of our listeners here, I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, myself included, I mean, I I don't have a background in, you know, data analytics or, uh, you know, management information systems or IT um, that, you know, and so um, I, you know, I think for a lot of folks, I mean, especially if they're coming out of school with, a, you know, accounting degrees and things like that, it's just not, uh, you know, it's just not in our, 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 our skill set. It's not, not in our, in our toolbox. How do you actually go about figuring out what you need? Cause I think that that would be probably a uh, pretty, you know, I think a lot of our listeners are probably struggling with, I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, as I said, it's, I, I think starting off with, if you're thinking about a data warehouse, scoping out a project that is a, um, you know, it's kind of a smaller gamble, smaller loss type yeah. of approach where you pick something, either pick something that it's either a capability you don't have, or it's a process that you currently do that's extremely painful. 
Like those are two, <laughs> two yeah. good turning points and then say, okay, I'm going to try to automate this. Right. Um, I mean, you do have to evaluate, I guess some other factors to consider would be things like um, the accessibility of the data. You know, if you're in a, um, company where you have a lot of, you know, uh, in-house development already, um, your abilities to understand, the get to the data, understand the data are quite a bit different than if all of your data comes from vendors, right? If you, if it's a lot of vendor relationships, all of your data comes from other software, um, you know, you may not have assessed that when you were buying the software before. So, I mean, we have a few, um, you'll see that in, I think almost any company that's just starting to use their data, they'll find that they have vendors who are um, only offer a reporting platform and don't give access to the backend data. I mean, that, you know, you can end up a little handcuffed there and you may need to switch if you really, but once again, it depends on what, what that software is doing and what data you're trying to access. But I think, um, you know, some of the ways that, that people get either decide not to do it at all or take on a project and fail is um, trying, trying to boil the ocean or thinking, getting sold a Ferrari when they just need a reliable Honda Accord. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I and I think that that's actually and and you're hitting it right on the head because I think that as finance leaders that's what we're concerned with. We're concerned about the fact that we're going to get you know that we're going to kind of get oversold, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean for a lot of businesses if you if you have zero or very little data capabilities, you probably don't need the Ferrari. You yeah. can start you can get the Honda Accord and be getting to and from where you need to be. Right. And then eventually get to that Ferrari. I mean, you know, as you become a more um, data driven business, um, if you built the that um, core functionality, well, adding on to it is not going to be hard. Um, and that which kind of gets into a lot of the newer architecture, like when people talk about things like data lakes or, um, you know, newer um, approaches to accessing data. Um, I mean, if, if you start with, or if you already have an existing data warehouse and you're finding it stale or doesn't do things that you want to be able to do, um, there are mechanisms. Um, most um, data lake platforms or, or ways, uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this, but um, that you can absolutely still use your existing data warehouse or build some of the more core functionality. I, I, and I think, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe this phenomenon, but I think um, part of the challenge with data warehousing is that in the earlier days of it, you know, the history of data warehousing, so to speak, storage was extremely expensive. And so right. the design was driven to be as efficient at storage as possible and not necessarily as easy to use as possible. And nowadays, storage is extremely cheap. So you can really build, or even if on the deeper levels, it's technically very sophisticated, um, you can build very simple to understand data structures that give the business a lot of capability and are not, don't feel too hard to use or, you know, like they don't, it doesn't have to be like, the 80s and 90s when you you know yeah. you were just trying to maximize every um every bit of storage that you had right, right. It, now you can build it you you can give up you can um be a little heavy on the storage and give um business capability um it's a much better approach i mean that that's a project that's going to succeed right 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 so, I mean, I mean, would you say that, uh, you know, kind of data, data warehousing now, I mean, that uh, when we're building a data warehouse these days, it's more around kind of kind of usability. That's kind of the it, what What are some kind of rules of thumb, I guess? Uh, I, I mean, what, what are some of the things that uh, I should be thinking about, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm building a data warehouse? I mean, what are what are what, what should I be thinking about? Is usability kind of the number one thing, uh, do you think? Or I think um I would sort of start with um, thinking about capabilities you're missing or questions you can't answer. Okay. So, um, so let's imagine that you're operating on a system that doesn't really store history and you, and that's a capability you would like to have. Well, there are, um, and even um, not even having to buy software, like you can write 
that you can find ways to sort of have a code pattern and build out a lot of um, change data capture type tables, like so that capability of keeping a history. It won't be business friendly yet, right? You, but you, you have to understand those core capabilities first. So what things are missing? Like, do I, is, does this data does not even exist or is it blown away every day? Or what, you know, what, um, what are things I've tried to do that I can't do? That's, right. a, I think, a very good place to start. And once you establish those things, like, is it, is it that the data is not available or is it that we need to build the, we need to store the history for it? We need to build some capability to do that. Then you, um, you can just, you can very quickly build out um, a technical solution that may not be business friendly yet. Um, as I said, like, there's some, there's some simple code patterns to do things like change data capture that at least gets you the history. But at the end of the day, no, no matter which um, technical architecture or um, methodology you use to capture history, you do data vault, you do change data capture, you do whatever, um, you have to build that business friendly layer on top at the end, right? That, that's the really important piece. And if you don't ever get that, um, getting the value out of that investment is extremely unlikely to happen, right? The analysts are going to be, I don't understand how to use this. I don't know what this means. So that business friendly layer and building that out. And that's, that's especially where the rubber hits the road in terms of that um, business and technology working together to build that layer out, right? To understand what, you know, what do you need? What should this be called? Um, and it takes some time. I mean, those those conversations can feel painful and a little awkward. Like, I don't. Why are we talking about the definition of a quote? For right, right. <laughs> weeks or whatever. Yeah, is. yeah. But, but it. Um. I mean, it, you can uncover so much about. I did not know that that's what you meant. You know, when you said quote, I meant this. You meant this other thing, and it's. You know, it, it tends to make the business stronger. Um, I think another interesting thing that does um, happen with data warehousing a lot is um, when you're, when that process is going really well, when you have that really good interaction between the business and technologists, um, sometimes you'll uncover things um, like business processes that can need to be improved, efficiencies that can be gained, right? Um, when I took, I did um, a data vault course um, quite some time ago, uh, sometime last year and uh, it was given by the the guy who developed Data Vault. It's a, it's a really interesting technology, and he told the story of um, you know uncovering like they 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 kind of had a gap between one section of the data and the other, and they learned that there's there was a manual process where a guy like went in and added some stuff to the account number for we'll, we'll use I, I don't recall the details right, but That's they okay. added something to the number and then it went into this next system. And so now you've broken that connection between those two systems. And, I see. you know, they had no idea that that capability was lost or that there was that much time that went in between and they made some process improvements to both stop changing the number, um, speed up the onboarding process between this system and this system. Um, and that's when, I mean, that's when you really, you know, besides that data capability, you get all this process improvement, you get efficiency, you get more understanding just day to day about how how your business operates, how business processes operate. I think uh, it, so. I mean, I, I want to try to kind of highlight some of the things that you've said here because I think I think there's just there's a lot here. Um, one of the things that I think that uh, I think is pretty important is is that uh, when it comes to sort of getting the most out of data, really, uh, you know, when we're when we're putting together our data warehouse, it's made to solve business problems. It's not it's not data trying to be data for data's sake. And I and I think that sometimes I think that, uh, you know, especially when I'm talking to CFOs, when I'm talking about folks that are in charge of that part of their organization, they yeah. think that uh, something magical is going to happen when they actually buy you know, a reporting tool or something like that. And that's not really the case, it, you know. So data, it, so business problems should really mm -hmm. dictate data. That's that's kind of, I, I think, at least part of what I hear you saying. Uh, is it, I mean, is that a fair statement? I, I mean, I think that, that it, it's the key place to start, right? Okay. 
you understand you're getting a return on your investment to, I mean, it, it does require, so, um, so yeah, I guess to sort of summarize some of the points we've talked about, there's yeah. that, that detail you need to get the terminology right, to make things user friendly, to make things accessible. But before that, there's the, what should be here? What, what problem do we solve first? And the, the better you can say, well, this is, this is our core business. And um, this is something that I think is another way sometimes that these projects go sideways is that a company thinks of themselves as one thing. Maybe they, the project is focused on the wrong measures or the wrong area um, can sometimes make it feel like you didn't get your return on investment. Right. But it's, but fundamentally, like if you, if you don't do anything with your data, because longer term, like let's, let's imagine you nailed it, right. You set up your, you start your data warehouse project, you've picked the right area. You've now taken a process that used to take a week to build out and um, reconcile. And it takes a, an hour to run, you know, um, at worst. Right. And, right. Um, and you've given yourself some more capabilities. Well, it, if that's done well, um, then you can build onto that. Right. It's not like that's your people think of a data warehouse, like it's going to be this, one giant solution that does all the data in one thing, right? But it's, yep. really, it's a more, it, it should be a more modular exercise where you build, here's this capability and you make sure it integrates with the next piece, right? So it's, but you're adding on until eventually you have a data warehouse that has the connections it needs. And then you can do things. That's where you start to build the capability to do things like, data science where you make a connection you had no idea was important. You, you know, you under, you, you learn something about customer behavior that saves you a ton of money or makes you a ton of money. Right. But you have to get those fundamentals down first. I mean, it, it also comes down to trusting the data. I mean, the other benefit of taking this approach is that that gets you, okay, our, you know, our monthly pack is, it matches what we've been producing exactly. <laughs> and now I can do these other things, you know, and suddenly people trust it. They're excited about building the next thing. And before you know it, you ha you build some really phenomenal capabilities. Right. right. Well, and I, and I think that I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think, I think a lot mm -hmm. of folks, they look at kind of the uh, data warehouse is going to be the be all and end all of the business. And that all of a sudden, if I have this, then I got a leg up on my competition. I'm going to be making more money. Things are going to be efficient. The, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the clouds are going to part and, uh, you know, a big light's going to come down through the sky. Right. I mean, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're, that's what we're hoping for. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I, I think, uh, you know, and I think what you said is right. You know, we're, we, we should think about this in terms of business problems first, and mm -hmm. we should think about it in pieces, not necessarily kind of one big thing um and, and i and i think that that's uh i i think that's i i think that's right i think that's uh and i and i think that's a a a, a profound thought that i think a lot of folks i think do a lot of companies miss yeah I, absolutely i mean i i've talked to plenty of people in this industry in the data warehousing industry or um, you know, you meet people and tell them what you do and they're like, oh God, we spent so much money and it was such a disaster or whatever. And, and most of the time it is because either they were, it was over-engineered or it was um, not the right information, you know, not the data that they needed. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, the more it's it sort of start off tactical and it becomes something, you build it with an eye towards the longer term strategy, right? But you're, you solve some tactical problems, you get that payoff, you get the trust, and then you get to build on that until you have some, you know, strategic capabilities you, you weren't even aware were there. And you've got that Ferrari, you know, you've got that, I can do things nobody else in my industry can do, but I also made my business way more efficient and saved some money or, you know, automated some things along the way. Um, I mean, I think that's absolutely, I've been in a few successful projects and that's very much the approach. It's um, the um, agile methodology, right? It's the business and technology working side by side to solve problems together. And that's how it, it has to be viewed as a partnership and not, oh my gosh, we're going to spend all this money and talk to these people. We don't understand what they're saying. And, you know, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, well, and and I think for a lot of us, I think that that's because because that's another interesting thing that I think I think you 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 uh, talked about very well is is that uh, there does have to be this kind of meeting of the minds here between the technical folks and the business folks, um, and and we got to put our time in there. I mean, uh, you know, because I mean, because uh, if we don't put our time in there, you know, that's when you end up uh, with the disasters. Um, if you, it, it, I, I don't think I'm betraying confidences here when I when I say that uh, you know I mean you didn't really start off as uh, I mean I think you kind of more kind of started off kind of on the business side of things and then you kind of you know you move towards more of a technical type of a role. Um, it how do you I mean how how do you do that I mean because uh, because uh, I mean it's almost like somebody has to like somebody's got to go to the other side, you know, it's almost like, uh, um, uh, what was that game with that, uh, you used to play when you were a kid, uh, red Rover, right. Uh, you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody, somebody's got to try to go over to the other side. Um, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you, I, maybe that's a bad analogy. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure that our listeners will let me know, but, uh, you know, but, uh, I mean, how, how do you, how do you do that? How, how, I mean, if I'm trying to get, if I'm a business person, I'm trying to learn more about data warehousing, what do I do? Uh, so yeah, there are some really good, and um, I don't know if you have a way to share links, because I was going to say, I, I think you mentioned a book, like maybe a... We can. Yeah, I was going to say, instead of a book, like, yeah, I can give you a couple of blogs that I think are pretty good. Um, there is a, a book that I have used, um, it's called, um, actually, let me look it up really quick. It's called a Azure Data Warehouse Design. It's a little older, so it's not, I mean, I think some of the um, architecture, there's some more, maybe a little more modern ways to do this, but conceptually, it's, I think it's, it's written for business people, but it, it's, uh, it's all about doing that, picking a business process and modeling it with the data and then approaching that as your approach to building, you know, um, in a, in a pretty rapid development way, building some capabilities. So I, I always thought that was a pretty good book to kind of, it's more about understanding, I think, Agile, like what it's like to do something where you're having that regular interaction with technical people and letting them, you know, putting that time in and getting that outcome, right? Like kind of whiteboarding and then, and that evolving into technical design. I think it describes that process pretty well, um, but I, I can share some, um, a couple of other links too that I think um, are some pretty good places to start to understand. Yeah, we can uh, we can definitely uh, uh, you know accommodate some links and uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we can definitely do that. I think that that would probably be helpful for a lot of folks who uh, you know again they're kind of feeling their way around trying to figure out how, what in the world to do here. Um, mm -hmm. What what are some of the big pitfalls that you see? I mean, so like uh, you know we we uh, I I mean we've we've talked about uh, some of the the uh, disaster scenarios. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, you know people pumping in uh, you know tons of money into this project and then getting to the end and it just end up kind of with nothing. Uh, what are some of uh, you know some kind of maybe common uh, data warehouse uh, mistakes, uh, design flaws, pitfalls, those types of things? What are some things that you see? Really good question. I think, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, most of the time, I would say it's bad assumptions. Like if you if you're not getting enough of that engagement between the business and the technical, but you're asking, you're, you're pushing on a delivery, you're going to end up with developers making assumptions and saying, well, I'm guessing they must have meant this and they're going to run with it. And it may or may not be in the ballpark of what you intended. So that's that's one way. I mean, the more you give that, um, and it's not like you have to you have to go to every meeting, but just making sure you have some resources available so that you can get those frequent check ins to say, you know, because and I I think um, most of the time the the faster that you show something to the business, mm -hmm. even if it's just a really rough prototype. Um, to say, am I in the ballpark? Oh, yeah. no? Okay, let me go back and fix this. Now, am I in the ballpark? That's when you get that success. I think when people are afraid, like, I think fear tends to be a lot of, on both sides, tends mm -hmm. to be an obstacle to success in these types of projects. Because if the technical resources are afraid to ask the questions, they're not going to get it. If the business people are afraid to to either push back on them, to push back on technical people to say, wait, you're, you're so far off the mark here. <laughs> Can we do this over? You know, um, 
and being confident that you're right about it, you know, um, that I think both that um, fear of engagement on either side is a real pitfall like that. You end up with somebody that's done a ton of development and it's not there. It's not right either because on either side, the communication didn't happen. So I guess it really, it boils down to a lack of communication. Like the more transparent both sides are about, this is what I want, this is what I'm doing, the more frequently they interact and kind of demo on each side, the more everybody learns, the faster you get so a usable product, right? And it's, it's yeah, well, I mean, people well, are accustomed to that engagement all the time. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and and I think that the, I think uh, uh, the point you made is a good one. I mean, there's no way to kind of get through this fast. I mean, you're you're gonna kind of get you're gonna kind of get uh, a product that you put in the time for, and so I think the, mm -hmm. that's a you know um, that's another thing. I think uh, you know certainly uh, has been a, a lesson to me over the years. Uh, I, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and I I would encourage uh, you know some of uh, some of our listeners out there. You know, you got to put in your time. I mean, and 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 uh, the things that seem like they're kind of uh, just uh, you know, kind of kind of minute details. Those those are sometimes some of the most important things. And so, uh, making making sure that you're putting in your time with your developers, making sure that uh, you're putting in your time with the folks that are actually doing uh, doing the work of uh, you know doing the coding and actually putting these things together. I think I think is a, a big uh, big part of this. Um, uh, so yeah, no doubt, no doubt about that. Uh, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our folks out there too, you know, they're dealing with kind of growing businesses. I mean, one of the reasons why they're looking at data, um, mm -hmm. and as kind of a way to kind of give them a competitive advantage is, is because they're experiencing success and they're trying to figure out how exactly they can sort of capitalize on some of that success and really, you know, kind of really grow their business. Um, mm -hmm. how, how can you build a data warehouse that is kind of a, kind of has the, the capacity so, to sort of deal with a growing business? I mean, is there, is there some, any, any sort of tips, tricks, uh, anything like that? Hmm. Um, I mean, as I said, I, I, th I do think that that design towards solving an immediate problem, but with a, making sure it's a design that scales and that has in those integration points, you know, that you can add in other capabilities, do other things. Um, it, it's absolutely doable. Um, and especially, um, as I said, I think I, I, I do think if you're um, if you instead of buying the software, let's just assume because I, and I think a lot of people are reluctant to get married to a, a company like that, right? I mean, yeah. you, you can get a lot out of it, but it does have some pitfalls. So assuming that you're you're wanting to build um, some like a code base that you own, you know, it's your company's code. Nobody can take it from you. It's um, taking that approach of, um, as I said, sort of the more platform agnostic, like it's written in um, a code base that could you could switch to Oracle, you could switch to Teradata, you could switch to SQL Server, it works, or pretty close to works, like you don't have to change it so much. Um, that's pretty huge to scaling, because if you, you know, um, in a lot of cases, depending on um, your usage model and what you buy, like, you can, I mean, you can buy physical servers, right? Or you can um, use the cloud, which a lot of that pricing is sort of per use by storage. Um, it may not scale at first, right? So let's say you start off with the intention of a physical server and then you get to where that doesn't work and you want to shift to the cloud. If you've designed it up front that I can migrate this, like I, I know that I wrote this in a way that it can be migrated, that that's always a requirement. Like I want something that can be moved, that can be evolved. Um, that's pretty key, I think, to keeping yeah. up growing business. If you're in the early stages, yeah, you you might not need to go on the cloud at first, right? Maybe you just have, you have a server already you're gonna use. I think we've experienced that <laughs> ourselves. It's kind of like, here's our old server, put the yeah. data us here, right? And you, you repurpose something and, and you, you know, I mean, if that's well designed, that can get you by for a bit, but if your code base is flexible enough to be migrated to the cloud, then you didn't lose anything by saving that cost at that point. And you, now you can lift and shift, 
you can load it whatever frequency, right? I mean, you, you just need a, co a flexible code base, something that's not um, only built for Microsoft or only built for Oracle. Like you want it to be the more platform agnostic. Yeah, and and there is ways to do that, and so okay. so I th I think uh, you know that's definitely uh, you know something that I hope our listeners pick up on is is you don't you don't have to sort of commit uh, you know really hard to kind of one piece of software uh, you know necessarily right out of the shoot. Um, mm -hmm. So you know I think that I think that's pretty important. Um, let me let me ask you uh, one other thing because I mean a lot of our listeners I mean are going to be uh, you know they're they're CPAs they're business people I mean for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that uh, that uh, kind of uh, business owners really don't realize about uh, data warehouse building? Uh, you know, I think we've hit on some of them, I think, already. Um, but, uh, you know, but uh, what are some things that they just don't realize maybe about uh, about uh, data warehousing and how can they help the folks on the on the technical side? Because I think a lot of our listeners, that's really what they want. They want to be part of that solution that where they where the company can then sort of take the data that is around them and really be able to use that for competitive advantage. However, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they really don't know how to be useful, I guess. And so I guess I guess maybe that's my question. How can a business owner be useful to the folks on the technical side? Uh, I think I, I mean, the more um, sort of like we've already covered, um, the more you're available to answer questions, the more open you create a, um, a basis for communication that people don't feel afraid to just hit somebody up with a question and say, hey, I'm working on this and here's what I'm thinking, is this right? I mean, I find the more that I um, I get to do that, the faster that the code, you know, the code I'm writing is gonna be usable. Um, so, I mean, it, it's more than anything, just not being put off when somebody, and they may seem like really basic, you know, I how do you not know this type of questions? But if you're not, a, if you've been focused on code all day, like, you, you know, and, and a lot of times, I mean, I ask questions that are obvious, but I just, I don't, I want to make sure I'm not making a bad assumption, right? And so, like, giving people that, um, you know, being a supportive and available um, person to answer questions to say, hey, and I, you know, because it's already, it's a little nerve wracking sometimes to say, I, I get you're saying you want this, but do you mean this? Or you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of that, but um, but there are absolutely uh, cases where developers, you know, can make they can make surprising assumptions. Like they they don't if they're not working with the business every day, they're just they're gonna you know run with what they know, and that may or may not be right. So the more you you can be available to help check those assumptions and and just let people and you know. Um, I think, I think one thing actually that that uh, probably doesn't happen enough in businesses that could be a lot of value. This is more just me brainstorming. Yeah. <laughs> Well, oh, but but I mean, I think what you said there initially, I think is right. I mean, part of this is is that you know we have to realize that the folks on the technical side, it, you, you know, I think unfortunately, I think we might kind of make some assumptions that some of the things that are sort of self evident uh, within the organization. <laughs> They mm -hmm. may not necessarily be self-evident to those that are actually that are actually doing the coding, and right. and um you know and and this is one thing that I would say you know CPAs especially one of the things that CPAs are they're really really entrenched into the operations of the business most of the time most of the CPAs mm -hmm. that are out there they're very entrenched in the operations and I think sometimes when you're kind of that in it that sometimes you forget that other people and other uh, parts of the business aren't necessarily as entrenched as you are. And so I think the assumption that we sometimes make is, is that, oh, well, they know that that's obvious. And that may not necessarily be the case. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think that's accurate. Uh, and, and that seems to be something that uh, uh, may, may be sort of a, a common mistake. Uh, is, is, I mean, would you agree with that? Actually, yeah, I, th I think that that probably captures like the most common mistake I would say that happens. It's just assuming that the, the level of understanding of the business is just going to be there, yeah. um, especially for newer hires. But I mean, even for people that are have been um, a developer on your team for a while, they still, depending on how your company operates, they may or may not understand the day to day operations. I mean, I found um, I mean, I've been very fortunate. Well, I'm maybe a more extroverted developer than a lot of <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I found that um, when you build those relationships, right, you make some friends and operations in different parts of the company where you work that, um, you know, being able to just ping somebody, even it doesn't matter what level they're at, but just knowing I have somebody I can say, hey, is this how you do this? And knowing that I'm making the right assumption, just it makes all the difference. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the, you know, the um, executives or the, the controller, like the, those level of people, just giving them somebody, right, that, they, that understands it, that can answer those questions. Um, it makes all the difference in the success of the, the project, of, of any project. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so, you know, being available, being mm-hmm. able to, you know, kind of answer the que- answer questions for the developers. Again, if you put your time in, folks, I hope that uh, our listeners are, are hearing that is, is that if you put your time in, folks, that's going to dictate what kind of product you're going to get. If uh, if you, you know, if you're not putting in your time, it's it's probably not going to go well. But if you do put in your time. Um, then it can go well. And so, so I think that, uh, you know, so I think that that's an, an important message, uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, you know, for a lot of our listeners to hear, uh, no, no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking about that, um, I, I have valued, um, and this, this happens at my current company pretty well as well is, um, understanding the longer term strategy uh, yeah. that, that can also help drive, like, yep. am I setting up, like, are there capabilities, you know, that there's going to be, um, you know, some new, a new vendor or a new data source that we're going to be incorporating because we're trying to build something new, planning for that and being a little more prepared for that can help a lot as well. The yeah. more the team, or at least, and I, I mean, a lot of companies do operate where you have a product owner or you have, um, you know, business analysts or those people in that role to be the bridge. Um, I think it's better generally if like pretty much the whole team can can have that level of interaction but at the very least like a a product owner or a business analyst that can help be that bridge um you just without that without that connection like you're just not going to quite get what you're expecting yeah Mm -hmm. so so probably at least part of this is just about uh, you know breaking down silos i would also Mm -hmm. offer one other thing here too i mean uh you know a lot of this conversation and i hope that our our listeners are are picking up on this a lot of this conversation i mean we've talked some about software but really a lot of this a lot of the success for uh, data warehouse building is really around people it's it's Mm -hmm. not you know it's not uh you know necessarily you know technology is a part of it software is a part of it you know but a lot of this is just, I mean, it's just dealing with people and making sure that, uh, you know, that uh, we're connecting, making sure that we're communicating, making sure that we're on the same page, um, which, uh, you know, sounds like a very sort of a, a, a simple idea for for something that's that uh, seems complex uh, with, uh, you know, kind of harnessing data. But I, I think that that's probably accurate. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, what what would you say to that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that sums it up really nicely. I mean, it it really does all boil down to communication because you can hire the best technologists in the world and buy the best software, but if they don't understand your business and you can't explain it to them, it's probably not going to be right. <laughs> tr- tr- trouble waiting to happen, right? Um, so, uh, Patsy, any any sort of uh, uh, final thoughts or anything like that? Anything uh, that uh, you're working on that you wanted to share? Um, uh, what's... Uh, uh, what, uh, what sort of things are on your mind these days? Um, well, as I said, I mean, I, I do think it's really interesting to stay up on some of the, some of the newer technology that is coming out or sort of the direction that the industry is shifting towards. And um, people are, I think there's still a lot of traditional data warehousing people out there that want to build, you know, the Kimball Inman, like you hear, you know, dimensional models or the, um, whatever the traditional data warehousing and that's not really um how it has to work as much anymore i think that there's a lot of newer technologies in terms of big data and um data lakes and other capabilities open source software like languages like python that can that can do a lot um really efficiently um that uh it has changed a lot i mean i've been in the industry um a little over 10 years um 
and it's evolved dramatically. And then, you know, I mean, I think most people that do get into this, do you have the idea that they're going to do some cool data science? I'm going to build a model and do this thing. I'm going to get some machine learning and do whatever. And, um, and, I th and as I said, I think um, building on that foundation, like we talked about, you solve some business problems, but eventually building a bigger capability, you, you, you can absolutely get there from, from the approach we're saying, but you don't have to boil the ocean. You don't have to do it all in one, try to do it all in one fell swoop because it's probably not going to happen. Patience, patience. Uh, that's it. That seems to be the, uh, the the name of the game. I think that uh, that's a that's a great way, uh, you know, to kind of kind of sum it up here. So, um, uh, listen. Um, so, uh, Patsy, I feel like we're we're sort of barely scratching the surface here. Uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, maybe we can have you back again uh, if you're uh, if if you're uh, comfortable with that. Um, it's always a good time to talk to you, Dave. Yeah, it's always good to talk to you too. So, uh, so anyway, so well, uh, folks, there you go. Um, at least uh, the start of uh, of a conversation on data warehouse. So, uh, uh, Patsy, uh, thank you so much for being here, and thanks for being on Accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Accountable. Be sure to subscribe for more interviews and insights from today's business leaders. David Peters is a registered representative offering securities through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Carroll Financial Associates, a registered investment advisor. Peters Tax Preparation, David Peters Financial, Carroll Financial, and Satera Advisor Networks are not affiliated. He is located at 1657 West Broad Street, Unit 5, Richmond, Virginia, 23220, and can be reached at 804-332-1373. The views depicted in this material are for information purposes only and not necessarily those of Satera. They should not be considered specific advice or recommendations for any individual.